Buona tarda, buenas tardes. Good afternoon, smart citizens. Welcome to day three of the Smart Cities Expo World Congress. My name is Femi Oke. I am your host for this main auditorium. Let me just give you a little tour of it. Podium, keynote chairs, and I'm going to point out the microphones because we do Q&A in this space. There was one in the aisle here. There was one in the aisle here. And there is one in the aisle right here. So when you hear the plenary sessions that happen in this space and the keynote conversations that happen in this space, when you know you have a question and you would like to be part of that conversation, you just walk up to the mic, stand there, and then we will know that you're ready to participate. So we start this afternoon looking at digital transformation. You will be seeing and hearing from a broadcaster and digital guru, and also a cyber expert, security expert. I know that you are here to see them, and I don't want to keep you waiting any longer. So please welcome Shira Rubinoff and Pipo Solano. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. This is a bit like cinema. Pleasure thing. to I be here. I don't know. Here. Thanks, Femi. It's amazing. Great. Uh, I don't know. Someone is going to sleep there sometime. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Sherry, for being here, too. Um, this is an amazing session uh, because I think we need to talk more about this topic. Uh, as you all may know, the United Nations estimate that two thirds of the world population will live in urban areas by 2050. Yes. While this happens, cities adopt new digital paradigms, uh, new digital technologies from the IoT, uh, Internet of Things, to artificial intelligence, with a clear, um, let's say, risk of cyber attacks uh, that can grow every second uh, as um, we have different connected devices. By the way, just focusing on IoT devices, uh, which could be like a way to explain a city, a whole bunch of things connected, uh, it's expected uh, that there's going to be 20 million IoT devices connected by 2020. When we say 2020, it sounds like very far. It's just in a couple of months. Um, as well, um, we can think that as a quick update, and I don't want to worry you, but in US alone, on the last years, there's been uh, at least declared or counted, um, announced, explained, more than 170 city and local governments that were attacked and compromised. That means that it's essential to bring to a smart city World Expo Congress brilliant minds like Shira Rubinoff to talk about cybersecurity. We talk a lot about smart cities, innovation, how can we connect everything, but what happens if something suddenly disconnects? What happens if we get attacked? How are we going to live then? Shira Rubinoff is a recognized cybersecurity executive, cybersecurity and blockchain advisor. She's a global keynote speaker and influencer. You can follow her. You'll see she's got a bunch of followers all around the places. And she currently serves as president of the New York City-based technology incubator Prime Tech Partners, apart from being the social media security firm Secure My Social Presence. And something else, she also serves on the board of the Executive Women's Forum for Information Security, leading women in technology, something that we need, more women in technology, more women in IT, more women in AI, more women in general. Uh, we need that um, savvy expertise from, from women, and apart from other several uh, various tech firms. Um, by the way, if you want to know more about her and you wait for some weeks, uh, um, I think there's going to be a book released very soon about cybersecurity called Cybermans. Welcome, uh, Shira. It's a great pleasure having you here. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And, and the first thing I would like to, um, because when we think of cities, uh, if we go on a smaller um, kind of city, if we reduce cities, we've got the big top cities, mid-size, small. Then we've got communities, residents, and then we've got city um, houses, I mean, your home, your local. And if we go even to smaller, Community, it's your body, yourself, how you connect. The reason why I say that is because the way Shira explains um, all the cybersecurity needs comes from in a part, um, from a human part, point of view. And you tend to say that the weakest part of the 
cybersecurity chain comes from human. Well, How is that? Yeah, that is the general understanding. However, I say, you know what, let's make the human part of the solution. They don't need to be the problem. And I talk a lot about cybersecurity as the umbrella over all of their technology. When dealing with technology, you need to think cybersecurity. And I talk a lot about something called cyber hygiene that pertains to organizations, it pertains to personal in some aspects, which we'll get to a little bit later on, but certainly to smart cities. I break it down to four categories. The first would be training across the entire organization, and that can be translated also within the smart cities, training across anybody who's dealing with the aspects of smart cities. What does that mean? That means ongoing training, but first let's take a step back. Today, it's the first time in really in history, we have three generations working side by side with each other that come from very different mindsets. We have the boomers, we have Gen X, and we have millennials. And you can't shove everybody into one box and say, do it my way, or learn my way, or understand how I do it because I'm in charge. You really have to understand where these generations are coming from, how they like to grab information and understand information, and how they learn. So when it comes to training, it's important to have training available, not assigned, you have to be careful with that, available for each of these generational groups on how typically they like to learn. For example, when you think millennial, you might think more of a gaming aspect, you might think video, there might be different ways of training that should be available cross-generational. And ongoing training, what does that mean? Typically in the past, organizations would say, today we have a training session. They might do it once a quarter, once a year. They throw this big training session, grab everybody in, uh, make a big party out of it almost, and go through training and make sure that they feel that their employees or the workers within these organizations would really grab that information. The problem being with that, that's almost called an information dump. And they'd expect within a month you'd come back and ask any of the people who went through the training, what did you learn? More often than not, there'll be little aspects of it. Training needs to be continuous, needs to be updated, and needs to be ongoing. Number two would be global awareness. Global awareness really means, what is the global awareness of cybersecurity culture within my organization when it comes to security? And that also, again, can be translated into smart cities. What do we expect of our citizens, of the people involved, and how we're actually bringing this all together? The number three would be updated security and patching. That almost would translate a little bit into digital transformation within an organization. So a step back over here, in the past, you'd have an organization where you have your COO and your CIO, both with different job, job uh, personas, and also they'd be incentivized in ways that would only pertain to their role. For example, the COO would say, I need to get things to run smarter, faster, and better. Quick, 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 I got to get it done. I have deadlines, I need to move it along. The CIO would say, wait a minute, we have security to deal with. Slow down, let's talk about the security. Let's talk about the patching. Patching, obviously, we should always have updated OS systems. But when it comes to patching, it's not a small job. For those of uh, people out there who don't understand what's involved in that, think about every device needs to be updated when it comes to patching. Think about third-party software. Think about people uploading or downloading information onto their machine that might have problems with this secure, the patching itself. Then you have to isolate it and put it into trial mode before it's actually put into production. OK, but, yeah. but if we go on, on some of these specific things that you were saying, yeah. so many interesting oh. <laughs> things that we should yes. kind of uh, try to um, go in depth with each of them. When, when you point out the human factor as a right. key thing, you and I read lots of things that you explained about, for example, the social connections. I mean, security, normally, let's say structures, connectivity is pretty sure, but people sometimes are not that, um, let's say, safe. And you talk, for example, about the insider threats, about non-conscious uh, threats. Tell me a bit about how you connect that things, that organizations, that social media, and the way people behave on organizations like the ones you, you help sure. to the city. How does that work? Certainly. I just want to touch upon the fourth aspect because that will literally lead into okay, what you're asking. Go with that. The fourth piece is zero trust. Basically, that's access into information. I'll give a quick example. Think about an old castle. If somebody in the olden days would, would go over the drawbridge, cross the moat, they'd have access to the full castle. Think of that as information. Zero trust means there's a guard at every door. Identify. If you're able to get access, you have access. 
So going into insider threats, two types of those. And most of the data breaches these days have happened because of, of some sort of insider threat. Number one is malicious insider threat. Somebody within the organization wants to breach the organization and will do so by either walking out information, by taking information they shouldn't have access to and taking it out, or non-malicious uh, insider threat, which basically means an employee doesn't realize they're giving information, which leads to your question. Yeah. Social media can be a big vector to that. And I love that because I'm sure that all these people around has LinkedIn accounts. Probably these days are, um, you've got a working hard, this LinkedIn account, connecting with a lot of people, interesting people that you're meeting. And Shira explained how relevant is who do we connect with on LinkedIn. I know this sounds like far from the city, but it's not because we are who makes the city. Correct. We are who kind of create these connected people. Tell so, us about that. Exact, exactly. Think about organizations, smart cities. Companies typically have rule sets, what you can and can't do at the workplace. Forget about the fact that BYOD, everyone's bringing their own devices. Everybody has their social media accounts. And you can't tell your employees or let's say even workers within the smart city ecosystem what they can and can't do on social media on their personal accounts. So let's take LinkedIn, for example. LinkedIn is the number one business tool pretty much on social media that I'm sure most people in this room have. And most people would like to put enough information out there for to be relevant, possibly, for their next job, for people to see what they're doing, talking about what projects they're working on, and the like. So here's an example of how it can actually work against you. Somebody comes into your organization who might be entry-level position within the organization, and they're put on a very interesting project. Might not be leading the project, but they're on the project. They're excited. They put it on their profile, working on XYZ project. Then there's a, let's call it bad actor, who's looking to infiltrate the organization, do a little social media surfing, see this new hire, and say, OK, I'm going to befriend this person. So bad actor, just to clarify, oh, yes, a bad it's actor, someone who's yes. pretending to be some other person. Correct, thank right. you. And um, let's say they disguise themselves or create a persona of a like type of company, that they are a high level ranking employee of that company that works maybe side by side or it's a competing company. They reach out to this individual, say, oh, this looks interesting. I love what you're doing. I'm impressed by your work. I'd love to link in with you. This employee's highly flattered links in. This bad actor may or may not contact this person right away. They may prove something, as I was discussing earlier with Pippo, called something called low and slow. They have that connection, but they don't use it right away. Wait a few months, then they reach out to this employee, and they say to this employee, I love the fact we're connected. The employee is seeing this high-level executive. Can you please make a warm introduction into another person within the organization? The employee is thinking back, saying, I must have met him somewhere. He's a trusted source because we're LinkedIn, and then makes this warm introduction in. So you can see the levels that follow is a level of trust. They're banking on the fact of the human factors of somebody being trusted because of a connection they have. People need to be very careful about A, what they put on social media, if they're putting things that could actually give over information that they shouldn't. Think of somebody in M&A that might be posting on Facebook saying, hey, I'm going to Redmond, Virginia. I'm looking forward to my projects. Redmond, Virginia, they're sitting Microsoft. Somebody does enough digging, they might see, oh, Microsoft is acquiring a company. Information giving is very critical on how you actually dress it up and what you share. Who you're connected to before you take it the next step, do a little digging backwards and make sure you're not being too trusting of somebody because of how they're disguised. Okay, and how do we protect ourselves then? I mean, it's, is it all about what we share? Is it partially what we share and partially where we share it? How do we protect ourselves? In, as a persona, as, a pe as people, as a community, as a city, as how do we do it? That's a great question. We live in a time where technology is at the forefront. We're moving so quickly. Everybody's in a rush. We have so many parts of our lives that are actually spun out by technology. So we're able to access data quickly. We're able to do things quickly. We're able to do banking. We're able to talk to our friends. We're able to text our kids. We're able to do all sorts of things, but we're moving fast. The number one thing that I tell people is stop and pause. Before you do anything, stop and pause. Could it be a phishing attempt? 
Could it be all sorts of things that are going on? A couple things that I tell people personally is number one, when it comes to phishing, don't click on links. Even if it looks like an illegitimate link, the most important thing to do, go to the web browser yourself and type it in. If you get a phone call, sometimes this new type of phishing attempt could be spear phishing, whale phishing into any type of people within the organization. They call you to instate panic. Your account has been breached. Here's the last four numbers of your, well, in the States, the social security number. They give you enough information to A, be trusted. What you do is you ask for a phone number or you look at your cards and you call back yourself. Never answer information on the phone, ever. It's never a good idea. So again, the stop and pause will save you heartache, will save organizations heartache. It's not going to be completely foolproof, but at least it's going to stop a lot of the problems. Can we apply that stop and pause to every single thing we do online? Let's say I'm going to publish something and I'm going to share some specific content. Should I think count to 10 before saying share it? Count to 15. 15, <laughs> great. We'll count to 15. And apart from that, yes. there is something else that you, uh, you and I were discussing before. We, there is something that we never do. And I, I would like to, if, to, if there is anyone who did it, um, we've got three mics, so I invite you to explain it. But have you ever read the terms and conditions of oh. any service that you're using on the net? That's All of them. You did? No, OK, I thought. I'd love to jump in on that. Thing. That is that is a very, is very anyone? important thing you're, you're highlighting here, Pippo. I want to give everybody an example that people are very, very aware of. Think about Candy Crush. How many here have played Candy Crush? That social media game or any game online that you have to have access to? Has anyone read what they ask you to do? We're going to get access to your camera. We have access to your contacts. We may record you. We may take pictures of you. We may uh, take your firstborn. OK, they don't do that. But pretty much you're signing over your life because people want to play the game. Quick, 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 yes. Similarly, when we look back at the Facebook Cambridge Analytica issue, nobody in that area, I wouldn't say nobody, but most people did not read terms and conditions, which was 42-page document about, I think. At the end of the day, you read your terms and conditions, you know what you're getting into. Don't sign away your life to play a game. It's not worth it. Terms and conditions are critical, what you're asked to do. And a lot of these apps are saying, I can use your camera. I can take your pictures. I can access your documents. Look at these things. You'd be very, very surprised. I encourage you all to look at some of these apps that you've downloaded. Yeah, but something interesting then yeah. is if we connect that to cities, um, yes. I don't know if anyone is going to deliver us the terms and conditions of the city. Because we're kind of signing a contract, a digital contract, yes. let's say UK. UK has around 4 million cameras in the whole country. And in London alone, there are 600,000 cameras following you. Every, every one of you, if you are in UK, are going through 14, or there is, let's say, there is a camera for every 14 people, and you would go through around 30 or 40 cameras a day. Who's going to tell us this is going to be fair? And we can trust our governments. But what about if there is a cybersecurity breach? What happens with our information, with me and my daily duties, routines, and things? How is that going to be protected? Well, let's think about also the aspects around smart cities when we talk about the security around that. Think about all the interconnected devices. Think about the IoT. Think yeah. about 5G speeding things up. The speed that, are able to, that we can do things is a speed that people can pull data, The bad actors can pull data. Yeah. What can we do as people? They will access my fridge. Exactly. They will know if I've got fruit or not. They will access everything. Well, think about if you talk about smart devices, that goes back to another piece. You're only as secure as the organization who is protecting that device itself. So you may personally be doing things, but if you're allowing access and trust, again, that big aspect of trust, you have to know what you're dealing with. So when you're talking about what could people personally do is know your data. That goes also with organizations. Know where your data sits. Know who has access to your data. Know, can, know who can actually utilize your data. And stop and pause before you do anything. Stop and pause before you allow. Stop and pause and think. Count to 10, count to 15 understand what you're getting into so you are actually educated around what needs to get done when it pertains to yourself, when it pertains to smart cities, when it pertains to any organization. That's a very critical component. So, so it's, it's clear that um, when talking about all these amount of connected devices, cities with uh, like our homes, reliability is key. 
We yes. need to grant a reliability environment, a reliable environment. Um, the, the thing is that one of the recommendations that you also say, apart from counting to 10, 15, or 50, if you have yeah. time enough, it's to be proactive yes. uh, and, and to prevent before it's too late. Tell me a bit about your proactive and reactive um, idea on, on the whole thing. Um, that's a, a very important concept, and certainly in the cybersecurity and the security world. In the past, we've been always playing catch up, reactive. Here comes a threat, we're reacting to it. Think about the threats across, let's call it the universe of threat actors. There's going to be a lot of them coming from all over the place. In the past, organizations would act as their own, as their own self and say, you know what, I'm going to figure it out on my own. Today, some of the major security organizations understand that we have to share information. This is also a good point for smart cities. That's interesting. Sharing of information, sharing of intel, sharing the understanding of what the threats are out there so we could bind together and be proactive in our security posture in order to stop some of these uh, incoming threats and incoming problems. So the sharing of information is critical, proactivity of being ahead of the game and not just reacting to the issues. I love it because you say normally that we should share our intel. Um, I don't know if it's happening at certain points, but you say normally that the bad guys do it. So the bad guys share intel and the good guys don't. Well, think about a ransomware attack. Yeah. We talked about this earlier as well. An organization, if they're held by ransomware and they pay it, who do you think they're going to share that information to and maybe split the profits? So one of the things I tell organizations is back up your data, but back it off off premise. Back it up daily, weekly, as often as you can. So if you have this ransomware attack who's holding you hostage from your business doing able to operate, you're able to continue your operations without being held hostage, lose money, have problems but back it up off-premise. More than not, organizations are backing up their data, but on-premise in the same spots where the ransom attacks are actually going to happen. It's amazing because when, when Shira, we were having a coffee early this morning and she was telling me about that, uh, back up your data. Many companies, and, and you held many companies on this, don't have backups for 15 days. Yes. How is that possible? I mean, is, are you really encountering situations like that. They yes. tell you we have a backup from 15 days ago, so the Even hack longer. was yesterday, and uh, that means that we cannot afford missing the 15 days of work. Is that real? It is real, and the big problem is some of these organizations may say to themselves, you know what, I'm not a target, I'm not big enough. Every organization is a target. Think of the people who are trying to attack organizations. It's much easier to penetrate a smaller organization, a little bit from here, a little bit from there. That all adds up. So everybody is a target. Backing up often is so critical. You can't stress that enough. And it, it, it amazes me. I mean, yeah. I, I, I've got my phone and I try to back up like every two, three days just in case and I've got nothing like compared to these companies. But regarding to that, um, that connects it pretty much to cities. Yes. We tend, and I don't want to be pessimistic on this, but we tend to talk about innovation, connected devices, 5G, with the deployment that all this means. But what happens if we have a huge hack, a huge cyber attack in a city where the traffic lights are connected with the bus, the bus is connected with the people, the people is connected with, I mean, what's going to happen? We hope it never happens, but well, think of it, everything is interconnected and it all could be framed as the same way. Think of an organization, think of any type of interconnected devices. Everything, even though it's interconnected, should also have a backup of its own that doesn't rely only on the source it's connected to. If it relies only on the source it's connected to, everyone will be at a standstill, the city will be held at its knees. It's very important to understand what it's connected to, what access it has, how's the security around it, who has access to it, who's able to make modifications, who's able to, to just get in there and make things go. Know your data, but know your data everywhere. Yeah, and of course, uh, and we were saying that before, and I would ask you if, if you, any of you have any question for Shira, um, start thinking on it because in one or two minutes I'll invite you to, to ask her whatever you're interested in. But before that, um, some of these attacks are well known as ransomware. Basically, they take your data, your databases, and they ask you for money yes. in exchange of your data, which is yours. Um, if that happens, we can see, for example, last year, I remember, or some couple of years, maybe in Baltimore, there was a huge attack, and 
We don't know if they pay, nobody says when they pay. But for example, we know that Maryland refused to pay and that turned the city like in a chaos for several weeks. Yes. And you say never pay because the bad oh. guys know that if you paid once, you will pay a second time and you're on the list. How do you manage that then? Well, think about it again. If, a, if an organization, a, a city, anything has the proper ba backups, has the proper access to reinstate what may be tainted, then they won't be held at their knees. If it's not done correctly, they have no choice but to pay some ransomware because they need to get moving. To have a city completely stopped and not being able to be mobile or to continue the operations the way it's supposed to is detrimental to everybody. So how do you operate? Having the proper cyber hygiene across your organization, across your city, having the right protocols in place, also having the right teams assigned to each of these things. People should know who's in charge. That's another thing that happens within these types of attacks. Massive chaos, massive chaos. Who's in charge of this? Who do we report to? Who's going to be able to reinstate this? Who do we, what do we do? So having the proper makeup within your culture of your organization, knowing who's in charge of what aspect of it, know where your data is, have the backs up off premise, and have a plan. A lot of companies, a lot of cities don't have a plan because they think that their security is strong enough. Understand most companies, most cities are going to be a target one time or another. If it happens, what is your plan? I, I, I love the concept of uh, cyber hygiene. Uh, I thought it was so, so smart. Um, well, I don't know if any of you would like to join this session just by making any question to Shira. Is any, anyone interested in this, in, in this room or any brave uh, soul who wants to just join one of the mics? We've got three mics, one every row. Anyone who wants to join? Any question? Are you um, worried about future? Are you worried about your city or about your company or about how this is going to work? People is really confident. I feel like they, none great. of you had a, a, an attack. None of you had any cyber attack. Okay, while, while they, they, they think if they are worried or not, there is something interesting also that you were saying um, and that I read from you, that when we talk about security, we should also talk about diversity yes. and diverse populations. Why yes. is that so important? So I look at diversity as a little bit more of a big picture than people tend to look at diversity. I believe diversity yields diversity of thought and mind, which in turn yields better security, better collaboration. If we put a room of all same type people, same generation, same race, same culture, same upbringing, you're not going to have much of a diverse thought, which would not have be as creative, but also may not come from different aspects of security thinking. But if you have a population that's diverse, made up of different cultures, different ethnicities, different genders, and different age groups, you're going to have a much better group of understanding of where you should be and understanding of your population as a whole because we're a diverse population. Okay, but then, and this comes back to your first answer, one of the things that Chiro was mentioning at the beginning is that when you look at that security and diversity, you look at three generations. Yes. And, and you are looking at the boomers, at the millennials, the, the, the Gen Xers, how do you now the face Gen Zs as well, they're coming yeah. up, yes. How do you face, for example, the, the millennials, whose people really used to share everything to, they feel like there is no privacy and... Correct. How, how so do you it's a little different and I won't say it as a whole because you never say everybody, but in general, a millennial approach would be, I live online, I don't care about privacy, I share everything, I'm checking in where I'm going. I will talk about everything I do because this is how I live. I communicate by text, I'm not gonna call you. Then you have your millennials who almost bridge the gap of the boomers, where the boomers are, come and see me, let's sit down and have a coffee. Don't call me, De definitely do not text me, I'm not answering your text, because I don't understand that shorthand that you're trying to explain to me. So then you have the Gen Xers who are kind of, they're straddling both, they understand the boomers, they understand millennials, and they kind of play in both worlds. How do you make everyone work together? understand these generations, don't try to make them operate in ways that they don't, but also everybody has to understand each other and a certain culture within the organization needs to be kept, but it needs to be also understood on who is working for you. So you're gonna have people who come in at 11 o'clock and are gonna stay till eight o'clock. You have people who'll be there as the sun rises and leaves at four o'clock and you're gonna have a different cross-generational approach with communication. So understand your population, make it work for you, not against you. 
Okay, I don't know if any of this shy uh, audience we have today wants to come with this last question. We've got 30 seconds. Oh, there is a question. Great. You see, they have to come when we only have 30 seconds. Does this work? Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Hello. This is very interesting. Um, I want to go back to the brief conversation you had about consent. And um, it seems a little burdensome, especially on users and consumers, to have to go through terms and conditions and agree to everything. And I mean, I think in other areas of our life, consumer law, for example, has long established that we are simply not allowed to buy toasters that are going to blow up, even if we sign the contract. Um, so I'm curious about what sort of things do you think privacy law or whatever evolved from it should simply ban? What sort of data collection should not be allowed? Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, here's the issue. We have different rule sets in Europe. We have different rule sets in America with different states having different rule sets. And there's no uniformity across all of it. But when it comes to consent, again, think of yourself as your own personal CEO. You're the CEO of yourself. If you're looking at being secure of yourself, you're going to want to read those conditions. Don't just sign off because you want something to happen, because in the end, it's going to come around and hurt you. So be very aware of what you're doing for your own personal self, and certainly when it comes to organizations. Completely agree with that question. I, I remember when in Europe we, we, we started to use this GDPR. Um, Tim Cook, Satya Nadella, Tim from Apple, Satya Nadella, Microsoft were saying, we hope we get some kind of rule like this in America because we need some regulation. Okay, last question. It should be really short because I've got another session afterwards and they're going to kill me. And uh, a short uh, answer from Shira. Thank you very much. Hey guys, uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, as a first step, as a city, uh, becoming a smart city, what would you recommend as a cyber security layers in any step of the beginning or becoming a smart city? <laughs> uh, great well, question. That's a very big question. Okay. Uh, I'll try to answer that quickly. Certainly when it comes to smart cities, there's going to be lots of interconnected devices, interconnected aspects of the city to make it run the way that you want your smart city to run. So again, know your data, know where it sits, know who, who has access to it, what your security protocols are for each of those steps, and who's responsible for it. That's a short answer for a very deep question. Thank you very much for that uh, short and amazing answer. Thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, this morning. The, 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 the room is packed with people. Uh, and uh, that view, Shira, has uh, brilliant advice to bring. Thank you very much, Thank Shira, you very much. for coming. It was a great pleasure. pleasure. Thank you Thank very you much, very Shira much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.